Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Ruby Rare Talks. Today we're talking kind of about pride and reflecting on pride because we've just come to the end of the very busy Pride Month. Um, and who better to talk to this about than the glorious Cherry Valentine, AKA George Ward. Cherry is an incredible drag queen and she graced our screens on RuPaul's Drag Race UK season two. And then earlier this year brought out an amazing documentary on BBC, which was called Cherry Valentine, Gypsy Queen and Proud. And I watched it recently and just wept like I loved it I, I thought it was such a beautiful documentary and we're going to chat about it a bit throughout all of this but I yeah I liked you before and then I watched that and was like oh my god I'm obsessed with you and I love you, <laughs> you. Um, and if that isn't enough Cherry is also a qualified mental health nurse so like you know just you didn't have enough plates to spin I guess <laughs> <laughs> Um, and if you've not seen my face before, my name is Ruby Rare. I'm a sex educator and author and public speaker, and I am a very, very proud ambassador for Brooke. And I used to work there for a long time. So we are going to be chatting about loads of different things today. But to begin with, hi, Cherry. How are you? Hello, darling. I'm good. Thank you. Very um, pleased to be here, to be honest. Yay. Nice to finally speak to you virtually. I know. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a lovely chat. Um, and we've got some really, yeah, I'm going to start off with quite an, well, easy, but very broad question. And then okay. we're going to speak a little bit more specifically about the kind of stuff you do and the intersections you exist in. So as the first question, just what does pride mean to you? Oh, that's very broad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think. Sorry. I think pride to me I guess it just means being proud and being proud of where you are and who you surround yourself with and how you feel in yourself and what image you put out into the world are you proud of that and is that where you want to keep going um and I think it's just a really important word that sometimes gets overused for the wrong reasons but um it's, it's actually a very powerful word isn't it pride proud proud and it's actually nice. I think I I definitely feel desensitized to the word pride, but yes. I don't feel that with proud. No, they are very different words, aren't they? Proud and pride. Pride is decent, like it's very. I, I'm desensitized to the word myself. I think it's because of so much that goes on with pride, like corporate pride, um, which isn't the same as like I would say internal being proud, like proud of who you are. Yeah, it's very different. Yeah. How are you feeling at? the end of pride month because i've had lots of chats with my friends and like my pocket of the queer community and all of us have found this this pride month kind of weird and like really corporate and all of us were just kind of knackered from it all so it literally it got to the first of july and we were all like oh my god thank goodness for that we can just go about being like <laughs> our normal selves <laughs> who are queer all year round Yes, I know, literally. And that's the thing. That's why I always find Pride Month so strange because you don't have to just be proud for a month of the year. We have to try and be proud for 12 months of the year every single year of our lives, you know? And it's really difficult sometimes when it can feel like people only understand that or want to be open to a conversation more a month out of the year. Um, so it's quite a, a, exhausting when you come to the end of it because you find like, all the people in the queer community, a lot of us who work in like the entertainment side, get more bookings around Pride time. And it's just, you feel like sometimes businesses only really want to work with you because they've got an umbrella, like a, a rainbow in their profile picture. Do you know what I mean? That's sometimes what it feels like. Um, but at the end of this month, I do feel a little bit tired. Yeah, it's always tiring at the end of Pride month because it's just so busy. But this is also the time where we all need to like look after ourselves and each other and recuperate a little bit because it is, I feel very conflicted about Pride Month mm. and, off, and sometimes it feels like Pride Month is often more catered towards the straight people than queer yeah. people. Oh, 100%. Yeah. But it is still really important. And, you know, when it like, it's the time when you can make a lot of like, I feel like Pride Month and then around Valentine's, I mean, you must do a lot of bookings around Valentine's. I do. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're like really busy times of the year for me and as much as I 
can feel a bit of resentment around them I've also got to hunker down because like I've got rent to pay mm, yeah and they are like incredible I mean don't get me wrong I love pride month in the fact that it's the, like one of the only times in the year that the straight people around me and like I mean there's not that many but there are like a lot of the straight <laughs> people and like cisgendered people around me they do come to me with more questions than they maybe normally would because they see things in the news like people doing a lot more interviews about things that they've not really heard of I've had a lot of conversations this year especially about the use of like pronouns and like the difference between gender sex and sexuality a lot of um, conversations around that which has been really interesting and refreshing nice oh yeah I I agree and I'm really glad to hear that that's your experience as well and what does travel at pride mean to you because this was something I didn't know about until I saw your wonderful documentary but if you are maybe able to like describe what that is and then what it means to you that would be great I mean travel at pride is sort of a, a branch um from your traditional prides it's just something else to be proud of I suppose and it was never something that I really thought that I could be proud of being like um from a traveler gypsy background but um I discovered it when I felt was filming the documentary for BBC3 and I just discovered this whole group of new people who were really proud of coming from a background that I wasn't necessarily ever really proud of coming from so it was nice like I said before about um, opening conversations about being proud about gender and new things in in that realm for people who didn't really understand it was sort of the same for me even though I was from the community um, from the Traveller Gypsy community I didn't know much about it because I really didn't connect with it that much was when I left home Um, so it was really nice to discover that and be able to chat to like-minded people who had very like some very different experiences to me but some very um similar experiences that I could really like associate with um, it's just a nice way I think all these prides are a really nice way to connect with people who are like-minded yeah and I think like pride is so important and so lovely but also incredibly broad and mm. even though there is there's something that connects both of us to all queer people like there's also loads that's very that might be very specific to you or I that other people might not understand. And actually, I've found over the years being in communities and spaces that are specific to other parts of my identity as well has been so healing. Like I'm I'm dual heritage. Oh. I'm Sri Lankan and British and actually seeing like brown queerness is really moving for me. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I organized a couple of years ago, I organized like a an evening that was kind of like conversations and community building, but just with like bi and pan people. And it was the first time I've ever been in a room of like 50 bisexual people. And all of us got really emotional because it was like, oh my God, we didn't know that this was possible. Like there's just that little, there's that added layer of understanding where you don't have to like justify yourself or validate yourself. And I really saw that in your documentary when you were in those spaces talking to people who are who like work for um traveler pride it was just really moving to see that yeah I thank you I think one of the main reasons that it was so moving like for me and when I re-watched some of the clips is because I literally felt like I was the only queer person in the whole community and that's some that's something that a lot of us actually deal with and it's very like it's, it's something that a lot of queer people go through they feel like they're the only one feeling the way that they do so it was really nice to be able to like have conversations with people that went through similar experiences yeah I'm so glad um and the whole documentary I think like I guess like the running theme of that was these two parts of yourself and being able to see them as like you as uh, an LGBTQ plus person and in drag and then your heritage and like your traveler community background. And it was really moving seeing both of those in the same person and like, you know, seeing someone being that vulnerable and open on screen was just really important. And I think if we can't, we have to tell queer stories with a lot of vulnerability because otherwise it's really hard to really to like empathize and to really see where people are coming from but I wondered what it was like what the response has been like to the documentary and how you're feeling now in with those like two parts of yourself I often think of it as like me me as like someone on the internet and me every day I think of myself in like a Hannah Montana kind of way like I put the wig on (laughs) yeah and you're literally putting a wig on and off (laughs) 
<laughs> so yeah how is all of that feeling now it just feel very like compartmentalized sometimes like you're living separate lives but I think doing the whole documentary and going through the process of meeting so many incredible people who do accept themselves like a lot um it was really telling to me that you can actually live in both let's say you can live in all these spaces and still be authentic sometimes yeah. we just adapt ourselves um not only for safety or all these reasons but it's just to be more comfortable um you do sometimes have to adapt yourself to certain spaces yeah. and I mean I still I still do that now like I still am mindful and I know a lot of people are what you'll wear in certain areas or what how you'll speak to other people in certain places in your life and that's not to say that's a negative thing it's just um you're becoming more aware of the world I think um so filming the documentary I've just become more aware of the world I would say um and the people who are in it we're also different and that's like there's really some beauty in that yeah that's such a nice reminder as well to step away because also I guess in voicing a lot of those like fears and vulnerabilities and insecurities it's also reminding yourself that you're not the only one who's experiencing them even though they can mm-hmm. feel very specific to us mm-hmm. like I I think a lot of shame whether it relates to your body or sexuality or gender or whatever can often be heightened when you just think you're the only person who's experiencing it and actually to Mm -hmm. realize that it's more complicated than that and that everyone is experiencing some level of shame or insecurity is really powerful so I'm glad I'm glad that's the legacy (laughs) of it (laughs) yeah yeah of course to be the reason why we did the documentary is because I just wanted to um get more of a message out that's not been that hadn't been shared before because you always see a lot of communities and they get negative connotations along with them that you can't be this sort of way you can't be this type of person in these communities but actually you can and it sometimes it just needs a couple of people to get together and say actually you can because we've already been doing it the majority might have like tried to quiet in us but as a queer community we know we're we're never quiet we always need to be vocal about a lot of things um (laughs) There are many things, but quiet's not one of them. No. (laughs) And then it's that one step further as well. It's like us as a community being vocal, but also seeing how those bilges are bilges are built. Oh my god, my words today. Bridges are built. I did a little flip there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, like seeing how those bridges are built. I think the people in the circle out like just after us like mm. our our friends and family can have such an important role in that and I think you interviewing what was his name Tyler's dad Tyler. like yeah. and just getting that perspective from a parent which like you know lots of parents don't feel and aren't able to feel right now and it's a journey mm-hmm. and you know I think mm-hmm. whenever I talk about this kind of stuff it's encouraging people to not expect change to happen overnight but yeah, just definitely. seeing like a parent with that attitude I think was so moving and I hope lots of people were felt hope by seeing that even if it's not something they're experiencing currently in their life that like it can happen yeah no I think I think they definitely did and to be honest that's why I was so shocked at meeting Tyler's dad myself because he was so accepting of Tyler Mm -hmm. um it made me really like reflect on my own parents because they they didn't accept me growing up like in terms of my queer identity and how I um, wanted to present myself to the world and who I was inside but like that's that's okay it's just because of their education do you know what I mean it's not to say that they weren't educated well but I just it's because they weren't educated in some of the areas that um even I didn't really know about you know and I think education really is the most powerful tool and as long as someone's open to education then you're good to go you really are yeah well speaking of education this is my attempt at a segue, <laughs> but I think it's a valid one. Like I, I think that drag has such an ability to educate and inform and challenge and also to celebrate lots of parts of ourselves that we might not yet know we're allowed to celebrate. And obviously like I, I love, especially in the UK, like the variety of drag that, that we're yeah. exposed to, like my I very much come from the kind of like sloppy East London 
gender fuckery drag space yes. um, mm-hmm. and I live in Margate now and so that's very much still the kind of drag that I am mm-hmm. immersed in which is lovely but even I don't know like my my younger sibling is a drag king and their whole person like persona is a teenage boy who's like really into pop punk so all the music that they were so it's like reliving all of their the like part of their gender expression that they never got to do as a teenager and like mm. all of that sexual frustration it's just you know one example of many obviously sorry any excuse to fangirl my sibling <laughs> but like yes, of course. you know it's it's one one version of so many where we can really look at ourselves and also challenge the world around us mm-hmm. um and that can be done in really surprising ways. So I I know before we were talking about Vula Crew, who's this wonderful drag queen who is also by day a farmer and works in like the, her, the, her agriculture community and has done a lot of really great advocacy work around mental health and the LGBTQ plus agriculture community and like how I think the suicide rates in in that space for queer people is so much higher than the rest of the UK population and I know that that's similar in the traveller community as well and all of this is a very long-winded and over-enthusiastic way of me asking like how how do you think drag has helped you accept yourself and advocate for your communities um, and how has being part of the traveller community influenced your drag? Um, drag has completely helped me um, accept myself wholeheartedly. I, I literally wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for drag, like 100%. And that sounds so dramatic to always say, but it's the truth. Mm-hmm. Because I was doing drag since I can remember. Like, as soon as no one was in the house, I would run to my mother's or sister's things and just, like, see what's through them and look through the makeup boxes and try on the lipstick and... It was just a way to get what was inside on the outside. And I didn't know what that meant at the time. But as you grow older and as you surround yourself with more people who have similar experiences, you start to understand that this is this has always been my way of just like expressing what's inside. Because I have been quite an effeminate presenting person, you know, um, and there's absolutely no shame in that. Because I, I identify out of drag as like a man. I see myself like my sex is male. And I'm not bothered about that, but I just like to say my gender's super fluid. So one day I'll wake up and put a tracksuit on and the other day I'll wake up and put some lipstick and a nice, like, bob on, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not necessarily drag sometimes. It's just how I feel in, in the day and depends what I'm doing. And then alongside that, it was also the drag, where drag to me was a step further and it's sort of always been my way of just being able to express myself and really convey a message that I wasn't always comfortable with conveying um, outside of drag. I think drag's a really powerful, not always costume, but it's sort of like a, just a powerful way to make you feel more confident. It definitely makes, like, fills me with confidence. Yeah. And um, it's just always been something that I've really, like, respected as well because I first discovered what drag really was when I moved to Manchester. I was going to university doing nursing and then um, I ended up going on Canal Street in Manchester, if anyone knows it. It's a fabulous place awesome. where you can see <laughs> so many drag queens and all queer people and it's incredible. So that's where I first really discovered drag and I was I was only like, I was 18, like 17, 18, which is fairly young, like, but still fairly like old to discover what drag is because um, younger people every day are discovering it, like younger and younger which I think is incredible. But, um, dra- yeah, so I discovered drag in Manchester and it just sort of took over my life alongside nursing. So I was doing nursing full time and then every single night I was just in drag just because I just felt more comfortable in drag. And then when I was in drag, I started going out on like the odd night by myself. And before you know it, I was working six nights a week and just talking to everyone. And I discovered do- by doing that, that people really see drag as like something really empowering because they used to treat me like a therapist as well. Do you know what I mean? Like I would just be walking down the street and I'd just be in my heels and my big wigs, like being larger than life. And then people would come up to me and pull me to a side. People like people that I'd never even met in my life and just tell me all these deep things. And 
I'm not sure why. Maybe it's just because people felt comfortable because they'd have a drink, some of them. I don't know. But um, a lot of the time, it's just really nice to be that person that someone else can feel comfortable to talk to, you know? So drag's, drag just really just is something that I'll always do forever. Mm -hmm. And I'm just really happy that I've found it. It was my calling, you know? Um, so, yeah. It does that answer the question? I don't know. <laughs> that's, such, that's such a beautiful answer because I think it all coming back down to like communication and the way that you communicate mm. to yourself and allow other people to communicate and think differently and yeah I think maybe from an outsider's perspective it's easy to look at just the superficial aspects of drag and be like wow that person looks fabulous cool move on and actually every single person I know who has a connection to drag it's so much more than that it's never just about the aesthetics and yeah and that's that's the thing um it doesn't have to be any spe like specific thing drag isn't just like a man presenting as a woman that's absolutely not drag it's not it's yeah. ex like it's gender expression it's playing with gender it's making us really question what we think about things like that and that's one of the most powerful things of it as well yeah i agree and how do you think kind of going going about it from the other side how do you think being part of the traveler community has informed the way that you do drag I think it's really interesting because growing up the women in my family were always dressed super fabulous and I've mentioned this quite a lot of times before but they they really were my my mother used to just go to the corner shop and like she used to throw on a pair of heels and put some lipstick on and it was only like down the road like that was without fail and my sister was always like that as well so I was always surrounded by like like really strong women in my family who would always present themselves in a certain way and it wasn't for the men at all it was for themselves and that's where I really found the power at because they were doing it for themselves and a lot of people used to say to me um is drag not quite sexist and I was I, I thought about it for a long long time and then I had a lot of conversations with people and a lot of even women say, well, I think drag is actually quite feminist. And it's, there is some elements of that within it because it's like empowering yourself to present in a certain way because you want to, not because anyone else is telling you that. So I guess growing up, I was just surrounded, yeah, by really fabulous women presenting in a certain way. And that really did inform my drag to always be like a really enhanced version. And I love, love playing on the whole gender thing and, because I, I don't think, I mean, this is controversial to a lot of people, that gender doesn't really exist to me, because I just think it's it's something that society's made up, hasn't like, it? So Gender is drag? <laughs> literally, literally. It's, yeah, you can. And, I mean, I've done drag many a times where people would call me a drag king. I've done, like, I've been a drag queen, I've been a drag artist, I've been a drag vet, like, big bit of drag monster. Like, there's all sorts of, like, avenues and elements to drag that you can really tap into. Um like creatively and within like like the gender spectrum but yeah I don't think gender exists and that's one of the things that do inform what does inform my drag now because it's just sort of play on that um it's not actually a thing you know yeah and so we might as well just be quite silly with it yeah exactly <laughs> exactly and I, it's one of the things that I think in a in I don't know and I hope like in the next 5 10 15 years that we can walk into like even a clothes shop and just walk up to something that we like and think, oh, I'd feel good wearing that and buy it, regardless whether it's in a male or female section, yeah. you know? I think I have a lot of conversations with my partner and some of my other really close friends about this when we are all chatting about gender. Um, and this comes from my partner, Alex, because they started to think when they changed their pronouns, rather than thinking about being like genderless and... Mm androgynous in that kind of way they were like no I'm gender full I want I want all the genders I want all the things put on me <laughs> and thinking of that as like this kind of chaotic glorious messiness of like not getting rid of gender but just like mushing it all up has I been love that term. Gen genderful I love yeah, that it's great well that. use it let's spread it far yes. <laughs> um but it's really nice hearing you talk about that as well and how like just how broad and exploratory all of this is it's really beautiful I've got one more like slightly longer question and then we're going to do three quick fire ones at the end oh, okay 
but this one is just asking you what kind of advice you have for young people who like you are part of the queer community and then as well as that part of another marginalized community that might make both those things a lot harder um i would say my biggest word of advice would be to just really appreciate that you aren't alone and i think that's such a broad thing to say but you're really not like i was part of many marginalized communities growing up and i think it was really um telling to me when i found people who also experienced the same things that i did and they are out there it's just really difficult to find sometimes and that can be because their safety could be compromised um which i'm very aware of but it's just to yeah be aware that you're not alone and the importance of chosen family is um a huge thing because sometimes yes we have our biological families and they really impact how we grow up sometimes and we have we, we have a connection with them regardless but it's also that doesn't mean it's necessarily less stronger than a chosen family's connection sometimes I, I like in my personal experience I know a lot of people who are in my chosen family who I'm closer with and feel more connected with than my actual biological family and that's not a bad thing I think that's really empowering um and it's beautiful so to, just to know that you're not alone and find your people because yeah. of that and more than ever it's really easy to access that especially with the internet yeah, I agree. And also that finding your people can take time. Oh, it, takes so much. it can take so much time. Yeah, I think I felt so much of my early 20s, like all of my journal entries are like, where are my people? I feel so alone and isolated. And actually, mm. it wasn't until I was like 26 that I really started to find people who I properly, properly connected to in terms of my queer identity. So, mm. and you know, 26 is will be really young compared to other people finding their people or really old or whatever yeah. yeah just knowing that all of this takes time it does it can yeah it can take time but it's part of the journey yeah oh thank you so much cherry i love that answer of course what a cute little chat <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so we're gonna do three quick fire questions so okay. Again, you're so eloquent and I love hearing everything you're saying that with these ones, like speed little answers. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So first one is what advice do you have for people wanting to start drag? Practice. (laughs) Was that a quick answer? You are doing (laughs) quick. Yeah, no, I like it. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. (laughs) Advice for building confidence um talking to a mirror a lot that's what I used to do before I um really started working on stage just speak to a mirror I do that a lot still Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's really good for public speaking it really is right okay and finally what does community mean to you family it means family yeah that was a quick answer (laughs) beautiful and you're gonna make me cry (laughs) I just like, I like to see it like, I don't know. I'm just very open-minded, honestly. And I just like to really just feel everything from everyone. I'm such an empath as well. So um, I don't know. I just like talking to people about these things. I think it's really important. I love it. It's great. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much, Cherry. It's been like such a pleasure chatting to you and finding out a little bit about what goes on in your brain. And I know that everyone who is watching this will feel the same because you're such a force for good in the world and it's just been really really nice getting to know you a bit oh thank you you too it's been lovely chatting with you hey well hopefully at some point we will do this in person oh yes we'll definitely cross paths we will i can sense it (laughs) (laughs) um where can people find you if they want to learn any more about you and is there there anything that you want to plug um there's nothing that I'm allowed to plug right now, but I can. exciting phrase. <laughs> yeah, um, just on the internet, I guess. So it's yeah. Valentine. There's all sorts of bits and bobs. I'm not really big on social media, apart from using it to like share news stories and talk about things in the news. <laughs> so other than that, um, it's the usual stuff: Instagram, TikTok. I love TikTok at the minute. Cute. 
well um, working on a little book which is exciting I can talk about that yeah and of that that's amazing I just I've always loved writing so I'm just I'm just writing at the minute yeah oh well I can't wait to see all the stuff that you're going to do in the future and yeah please do everyone who's watching this make sure that you check out Cherry's stuff and also if you have other questions about LGBTQIA plus related Mm. things the Brooke website is a really wonderful place to go and the Brooke social media so do follow there um I'm Ruby Rare if you want to keep up with my kind of stuff that's my name on the internet and until next time just going to say a big thank you to Cherry and goodbye thank you and goodbye bye